Final talk, uh, we are happy to have Joe Conlon, Physics at the End of the World, is the title. Thanks very much, Prem, and thank you, thank you very much to the organisers for arranging this meeting and for inviting me to give a talk here. It's been a really enjoying and enjoyable and stimulating meeting. It's really nice to be listening to talks in person, and thank you all for, st for staying for the, for the last talk of the conference. Right, so this talk I've entitled uh, Physics at the End of the World, and it's based on those papers I've been doing over the last few years, but in particular these ones in the last, in the last year, and so these pictures of the students, so Fien Apers and uh, Filippo Ravello. <coughs> ah, okay. so, so to say what do you mean by the edge of the world, the end of the world, first of all, he says something about what the centre of the world is, which is obviously a kind of a rather relative, relative statement. So right now, for us, the centre of the world is right here at FPUK in, in Swansea. But from some perspectives, this is not at all the centre of the world. So on a slightly not quite recent map, um, if you look very hard on this, you will actually, if you look up the top, you will... You will find um, the conference location there. And so from some perspective, we are completely at the edge of the world right now. So moving from geography to physics. So sometimes here's a map, you know, you have this map of string theory. You know, often this is done as the kind of the M theory map. And right slap bang in the centre of this map is the sort of the unknown M. The area where, you know, an area where alpha prime is one, where g-string is one, where couplings are all one. You know, the idea that the, the, the centre of the world is somewhere which is intrinsically strongly coupled and the physics of the centre of the world is the physics of understanding uh, strongly coupled systems, often with large degrees of supersymmetry. But if we think about something about our, our own universe, the sort of, you know, I'm, I've always been motivated by, you know, understand, to understand the, the standard models of physics and cosmology, why the laws of the universe, our universe, the coupling to the laws, why they are what they are. And if you say something about, think about our universe, one of the things that is very definitely true of it is that it's filled with hierarchies, it's filled with small numbers. Where you look in the standard model, you look in cosmology, you know, there's many ways in which the universe is kind of deeply, weakly coupled. It's true of the density perturbations, 10 to the minus 5. It's true of the couplings of the, the gauge couplings of the standard model, extrapolated to high energy. It's true of the Yukawa couplings of the standard model. Again and again, we see all these small numbers. And the other thing we see is hierarchies. There's huge sort of separations in scales. So coming back to this picture, the question of where are you know, hierarchies, where are weak couplings, where are, is n equals naught supersymmetry on this picture? Well, to my view, this, this is on the, on the edge of the world. It's far out in the asymptotic regions of moduli space, away from the centre of the M-theory octopus. So, the plan of the talk, physics at the end of the world. Where is the end of the world? So I just want to send the idea that the end of the world is the asymptotic regimes of moduli space. This is the regimes far you know, measured in distances of how far you would go on a scale of field would have to travel, what is the field excursion it would travel from the centre of moduli space to get there, to get to the boundaries. What does the end of the, and there's two parts, what does the end of the world look like? So here I want to ex look at the study of moduli stabilised vacua. If you try and construct vacua of string theory that exists in these regions, what do they look like? What interesting properties do they have? Looking at these from a holographic perspective, and then the second part of the talk is the physics of how we get to the end of the world, the cos a cosmological transit that will lead us so that our vacuum today is at this end, at the end of the world. And as always, I welcome questions. Um, interactive talks are more fun than non-interactive ones, so please ask questions as we go along. <coughs> okay, so as I say, that if string theory is a true theory of this universe, 
if it is the case that the, the ket that describes this universe you know, exists as a ket in string theory, then it must, this vacuum must contain a method of generating hierarchies, a method of breaking supersymmetry, a method of generating small, small numbers and small couplings. And from my perspective, this makes the boundaries of moduli space, the asymptotic regions of moduli space, appealing. So what does this mean? Where do we want to live? So the idea is that what we want to do is we want to live, uh, you know, to look at vacua, what are the properties of vacua that would be in the parts of moduli space that are a long, long way away from the regions of moduli space where g-string is one, where the curvature scales are all of the scales of the string scale. So you want, you want semi-classical solutions, which will be, and they will be separated by a field displacements that are substantially transplankian from these central regions of the moduli space. So the question is, can vacua exist with here? If we've got which have hierarchies, which have ways of generating small numbers, with scale separation, so that, um, at least if we're talking in the context of, say, ADS vacua, the, we de the, the KK scale is decoupled from the ADS radius. And if they exist, what characterizes them? Are there any special properties? Or is there some you know, infinite or semi-infinite landscape of vacua with you know, 10 to the 10 to the 500 or whatever it is, you know, possible combinations of fluxes, whatever, you know, that are all, that can all give you vacua in this regime. Okay, so that is something, I, uh, that second point is something I definitely want to argue against. And so what I will do is I will look at two, yeah, there aren't actually many sort of solid, well-studied proposals to ways of stabilizing moduli such that the resulting vacuum is in this region. So I look at the two probably best known examples of these. So DJKT, which is our 2A flux vacuum in 2A, uh, where flux is turned on and there's a particular kind of way of you know, array, change of sort of scaling the fluxes such that the resulting vacuum is, is goes, basically goes to kind of both large volume and weak coupling and with scale separation. And LVS, which is the large volume scenario, um, which I have a particular interest in where you, it's a 2B, which starts in 2B, it's a combination of fluxes and um, non-perturbative effects, and then there's this sort of, this nice sort of cancellation or composition of terms that puts you in a non-supersymmetric vacuum at exponentially large volumes. So I won't talk about KKLT, one reason for, you know, you've probably heard quite a bit about KKLT, but one reason is it, it isn't in the asymptotic regime, is that the volumes are always ra rather small. The other thing I will not talk about is De Sitter. In, in string phenomenology, in string phenomenology uh, most of the attempts to get to De Sitter space start with things that are basically ADS. De Sitter is too hard for me, so I'm just going to be sticking with the, the ADS versions of these. And these are also, in some senses, more interesting because you can frame properties of them in a holographic language. And as we will see, we get some rather interesting properties, whereas the, kind of the ways of getting to De Sitter tend to be a bit more a bit more ad hoc, and I will, so I will not discuss those. Right. So, so these are the two examples of moduli stabilization that lead to vacua in the asymptotic regimes of moduli space that I will be talking about. So I'm aware that I'm sort of a bit more on the phenological side of this side of this community. Um, so I. Obviously, I'm not going to kind of, I can't talk or review moduli stabilization at length, so I'm just going to say a briefly about these things, but then I'm going to come on to the bit, I think, which is rather interesting about these and is hopefully interesting for, interesting for, this, for this audience. Okay, so as I said, the first is the large volume scenario. So this is a 2B system where an interplay of alpha prime and non perturbative effects um, give a, a non susy ADS vacuum at an exponentially large volume, which scales as basically e to some constant over G string where the constant kind of arises from, I think, like the Euler number of the Calabi yau And the second one is the case of the type 2A DJKT flux vacua. So these are vacua in 2A, and the choices of fluxes can give you vacua which are either supersymmetric or non-supersymmetric, but I'll be more interested in the supersymmetric case here, where, again, you are at parametrically weak coupling and parametrically large volume. And in both cases, you have scale separation. You have a decoupling 
of the Kaluza-Klein scale of the internal manifold um, with the four-dimensional ADS radius. And everything I'm doing here is always, I should say, a compactification down to four space-time dimensions. It is always ADS4 cross something. OK, so the large volume scenario. So, um, so this is more to sort of so this flash up these. This is the, the effective four-dimensional theory is described by this superpotential, this scalar potential. And the point is basically that the resulting scalar potential is a minimum at exponentially large values of the, the calabi yau volume. Exponentially large values of the volume are then interesting because they generate, generate hierarchies and give you parametrically low scales of, for example, supersymmetry breaking, but plenty of other small numbers as well. The DJKT flux vacua, so um, this is then the, yeah, the potential and the, and, the, and the Lagrangian. So these, again, are similar, similar sort of time. So this is, this is 2A with, with flux, fluxes turned on. So, okay, let me just skip through the actual details, but come to the interesting, more interesting things. OK, so we want to look at, in both of these cases, we want to look at them in really, like, in really asymptotic things, because they're kind of the fundamental science question here talking about is if you have vacua that put you in this asymptotic regime, if you do a vacua of string theory where you know, the volume is really large, you do have where you have scale separation, are there interesting properties of such vacua? Are there general properties of such vacua? What can you say? Do such vacua exist? And if they do, do they have any striking features? So in both cases, what we want to do is we want to kind of you know, what, does, what do we look, look at, you know, really be in this kind of deep regime? So what does this mean? In DJKT, this corresponds to scaling fluxes. Um, so they, the flux integers go to kind of infinity. On some sense, like DJKT feels a bit like, um, you know, it feels a more like, one of, like some kind of more elaborate, um, more complicated relative of, you know, ADS across... 5 cross S5, you know, ultimately, what is holding this compact space up? It's fluxes. How do you put the, push the compact space to large volumes? You dial the fluxes up to, up to large numbers. But in contrast to most of the, you know, these Freud-Rubin-style compactifications, um, DJT has got this scale-separated limit where you can decouple the, the ADS scales and the Kaluza Klein scale. In LVS, in the large volume scenario, this corresponds to if you, the flux has stabilized the string coupling at very small values, then because the volume is kind of exponential in the inverse of the string coupling, this can, you know, obviously if the string coupling is 100, then you've got an e to the 100 here, then world to a mathematician, e to the 100 is not infinity. For uh, most physics purposes, you can treat e to the 100 as approximately infinity. And so the question I'm going to ask here is, Suppose these vacua do exist. So suppose they exist and they are good properties of string theory. So they are ADS vacua in asymptotic regimes with scale separation. What can we... Uh, yep. So, so they'll, they'll all have compactifications. So the four, our four-dimensional space-time... Our four-dimensional space-time is much bigger than the internal space. But the internal space is much, much bigger than the string scale. Yeah, so there's like a double, yeah. Yeah, so the, in, the internal space is deeply in the supergravity regime, but it's also the case they are comp proper compactifications. So the 4D space is even more enormous. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? It will be extremely large, yes. Yeah. So not, not because of the volume, but because of what? So, so the, because you've got scale separation, the four-dimensional ADS is, is extremely large. And so that will, so that will basically give you... But if you have it with the slide, is that it? Yeah. That's what gives Oh, it's, in, it's in very large. So the assets, so the, the volume here, the volume here is... So, okay, so this is, a, look, the volume there is referring to the compact space, but the four-dimensional ADS is even larger. Now, the reason I kind of write this is, if, if you're doing, a, like, a proper phonology a thing, you know, there are limits on the, you, you know, you never send the internal space to be extremely large because then you bring the street scale below the TV scale. 
So, but from a kind of question of asking about, so that if, you know, a proper phonological application, there's a limit on how big you want the internal space to be. But you can make the internal space, you know, much you know, arbitrarily bigger than the string scale length, and it remaining a compactification, because the notion of the compactification is really how does the internal space compare to the four-dimensional space. Yeah. So these are, these are compactifications in that sense, in the way that ADS-5, Process-5 is not a compactification, because the two radii are the same size. Yeah, so that's that isn't actually a, so I, I so I so I don't know because that isn't some that's hearing that is the yeah but the, so the, the idea is definitely here that you have a parametric yeah there there is something parametric going on here yeah yeah okay so the question we're going to ask is suppose these things are really exist as ADS vacua and suppose that a dual exists and so say what would be the the property of the dual what would be the spectrum of the of the low lying of the low lying operators. Okay, so I know this part is not a kind of a this is this is almost the simplest thing simplest thing you would ask, but the simplest thing you can ask has got some. And so and I should emphasize, I've no, if something does exist, I have no idea at all what the actual CFT would be. I mean, I think the question of can scale separated CFTs exist is, I think, as far as I'm not an expert on this, but it's as far as I'm aware, is an open question phrased from a CFT side. But this is the, so suppose these things exist. What would be what would be the properties of the CFT? Okay, so um, so just looking at just looking at the, the masses of what the moduli correspond to. So what you will find you tend to find in these is that the moduli the moduli of the Calabi has the Kähler moduli, the complex structure moduli, and so on. So you know, the heavy mode certainly decouple. It's also the case that a lot of the actual moduli decouple. Decoupling here is basically meaning meaning this case that. In this limit, where you're on the, you know, in this limit, that the the scaling dimension is going off, is, go, is kind of is going off and becoming large. But there are some things that are not. Okay, so what do we find? So with LVS, um, what what you find is that the low lying spectrum, basically the the only modes that would survive would be the volume modulus and its corresponding axiom. And interestingly, so the volume modulus, it basically zooms in on a single possible value for the conformal dimension in this limit where you would stabilize the volume at kind of, you know, these are enormously larger than the string scale, which would correspond to kind of 3 half on 1 plus square root of 90. And so one of the things I kind of really want to kind of emphasize here, which, I think, which to me is interesting, is so you sometimes have this talk of the landscape. The landscape is the idea that, you know, so I've done my picture of a Calabi Yau, and you would say, well, on a Calabi Yau, there's you know, however many hundred million Calabi Yau's, you can turn on fluxes in however many hundred million ways, you exponentiate the two, you've got any possible brain stack, any possible choice of fluxes, and then the idea is that anything goes, you can get anything you like. So this kind of thing is almost the opposite of this. So what it says are all these possible ways of turning on fluxes, if you have something like an L, you know, the LDS factor, you're stabilizing in this kind of regime where the volume is extremely large. All of these things, the ADS vacuum interpreted from a CFT point of view, they're all going into something basically where the conformal dimension of the volume modulus is looking like this. So in some sense, there's, a, there's kind of like a sink. So this is an asymptotic thing in the limit where the volume goes to infinity. But the low-lying spectrum, the low-lying spectrum of single trace primary operators is basically moving on to just like a unique Okay, so these are single trace, so you definitely have things which are like, so these are like one particle states, so you definitely have like double copies of those. But other than that, because the, the next moduli, because they're all scaling with kind of powers of square root of the volume, or, you know, some power of the central charge, so then you've got a huge, yeah. Okay, so this is something I think is, is interesting. So that's the case for LVS. Okay, so the other case I said we look, okay, it's also the case, I should say, before I move on to GKKT, it's also the case that if you look at the higher point interactions of the volume modulus, again, everything like fluxes, all those things, just are all kind of drop out. And the, you know, the Lagrangian viewed as an ADS Lagrangian, it's again, it's all, everything is uni uniquely fixed. The only thing you're kind of left with is the, is the 
is the ADS radius. So all the higher point interactions are in a similar way are all, are all completely fixed. So that was the LVS. Yeah, that's a non-supersymmetric thing. The other kind of reasonably well-studied case is DJKT. And here, again, something similar happens. So these are ones where you're, you're getting to large volume by basically turning up flux, blowing up fluxes. The scale, the volumes of the cycles are blowing up with the volumes with the number of the flux numbers. And again, it's the case that um, all the conformal dimensions, it's not the case, you know, or just all kind of go down to basically, essentially, unique values. So if you look at the supersymmetric DJKT spectra, you find actually something maybe perhaps even more interesting, is that the conformal dimensions, they're again going to unique values, but these unique values are also, rather surprisingly perhaps, integers. So what you're left at, um, again, independent of the kolabi yau independent of the fluxes, what you're basically left with is for the Saxion sector, so this is the sector coming from the Kähler moduli, you've got one field which would have a conformal dimension of 10, and all the other Kähler moduli, H11 minus 1, would have a conformal dimension of 6, and then their axiom partners um, have conformal dimensions then of 11 and, and 5. So again, this, you have this kind of picture that you have... Yeah, you, that you might naively think that all the different choices of Kalabi Yao, all the different choices, you know, the fluxes, that these things would end up giving you like a huge diversity in what you would see if you reinterpret these things from a, a kind of a CFT perspective. But instead, you sort of see this picture where everything seems to be kind of going on to kind of unique, unique, val unique values. And it's also, I think, interesting, and we don't really, I don't really understand this at all, but. Um, it's also interesting that there's, these things are all, are all integers. OK, so this is, again, to just say that this is yeah, the, the, the conformal dimensions in DJKT. That these are the values that are going on for the, would be going on to for the low-lying um, single, trace, single trace primaries. Um, and this is kind of, you know, this is what they are. I don't really understand why they would be so simple. I mean, one of the things I think is nice is that it does suggest that these vacua have some, there's some deeper structure underlying them that isn't very kind of obvious from the way we normally do this, starting with Kähler potentials and super potentials, and then kind of working through to construct the vacuum. There is, viewed from this holographic perspective, there seems to be some deeper, simpler structure, structure there. OK, so. Um, here is where I think mostly say that there's lots of this stuff I don't understand, so I'm going to say all the things I don't understand. Okay. So one obvious question is where do these integer conformal dimensions come from? Um, it's, not, it's not a structure that's at all obvious from the compactification point of view. You have things which don't look like they're going to give integers, and then suddenly at the end everything turns into integers. Possible speculative thing is that there is relates to the, there might be some underlying n equals two supersymmetry that is somehow sort of emergent in some sense in this infinite volume limit. Yeah, you know, it's definitely an n equals one vacuum, but you know, possibly if it's there's some hidden n equals two supersymmetry and there are charges, then that might be a thing, but I don't really know. One of the things I find most interesting is that, the, you know, is this, you know, it's hard to find vacuum in the asymptotic regions of moduli space. From a CFT point of view, the question of do scale separated vacuum is an open question. So, the most interesting thing would be the possibility that there's almost this, you know, this apparent uniqueness is because it just, you know, almost analogous to these kind of bootstrap plots, that if you, if you have CFTs that are really scale separate, that are genuinely scale separated, um, that they can really, that the conformal dimensions of the low line primaries can only take kind of very, very small, small, numbers, of, small numbers of values. That it's not like some huge field of many, many CFTs that can give you scale separation, but only kind of a few few kind of unique ones, but that, that's just sort of spe spe speculation. But yeah, but most of this now, but this is kind of the thing to say that there's, there's obviously some kind, there seems to be some kind of extra structure there, this in it, is, that is not visible from the ordinary kind of way of compactification, approach via compactification, but it is not to me particularly clear what that extra structure, structure would be. Okay, um, I'm just going to... Um, Questions of this, I'm going to move on to the other part of the talk, which is about getting to such a vacuum. Yeah, can, can I ask yeah. a question? I mean, especially the, the previous case where you only have one additional state, it looks like you can write down the cross-synchronization to see whether that satisfies or not. Because your conjecture is, is 
precise spectrum. And then it's either, it's either satisfies the structural relations or not. Uh, if, if it does, okay, that's the legitimate uh, theory. Now, as this, you haven't done that. You mean, you mean writing from, dealing from the ADS? So I don't come with a CFT background, but I thought that these sorts of things were, um, I thought those were not constraining enough to, I mean, th th there are papers which try and constrain what possible operators you can. I mean, there's all the, there's all the heaviest. Well, there's the yeah, heavy yeah. Well, but the lower lying ones, you know, this is it. And there's, there's, the dub, there's, the, there's the double trace operator. I mean, there's, the, there's all the, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the two particles. Yeah. Uh, uh, exactly so I thought, so I thought that these papers, these papers from like, what's it? Um, Penadonas, I mean, the thing that just that just that just crossing does not, I thought, did not really constrain, like holographic CFTs were not constrained by crossing. I thought that was a, an old result. I would not. Uh, I mean, I mean, when we looked for constraints, I mean, they, they, they didn't seem to be, I mean, in these cases of kind of extremely large central charge, there didn't seem to be anything which was sort of explicitly in the literature that seemed to be, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm some, and, and there's a, I, there didn't seem to be things which said, you know, these things kind of ruled in. I mean, that would be the ideal thing if you could rule in or rule out or kill these models, but there didn't seem to be anything which did that in the literature, in this, sort of these cases of very large central charge. Yeah. But. Yeah, although, although because it's a, it's a holographic CFT, so these are all these are all small. These are all um, have have one over n planks. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's one over there's one over n planks basically at, at, at every at extra every order. Yeah, so, so as I said, I think we, we, we did look for whether there were constraints, and they, did, they, don't, they didn't seem to be stuff. I mean, yeah, there is a literature on holographic CFTs, and they didn't seem that, yeah, these things did not seem to be excluded. So I, maybe I'll take that, yeah, take that after. Yeah. Okay, so um, getting to the other side of this, which is then, if you, yeah, if you have vacua that are in the asymptotic regions of moduli space, then the next question is how, is how do you get there? 
So we believe that inflation probably occurred in the early universe. Um, it's not kind of observationally constrained in any way, but I suppose the prejudice of most physicists is that the very early universe was more likely to be in regions of the kind of, you know, R curvature radius equals the string, string length, uh, G string equals one, the, generally the more central region of moduli space than the, pre the present universe. So if you suppose that you started, the, the universe started at some point in toward, more towards the center of moduli space, and has then evolved so that today it is uh, more towards the, the edge of moduli space. And then the universe has got to have moved from A to B. And so you can ask, well, what, does, what would living in the edge of, vac of moduli space mean for the, for the universe? What does it mean for cosmological evolution? And in particular, one thing I think that you know, people are interested in applications of string theory to phenomenology and cosmology is that this requires your, the distance you travel in moduli space to be probably significantly greater than the Planck scale. And this is one of the things that makes kind of, you know, string theorists is light up. It's because that when you travel distances in field space, when you have trans-Planckian field excursions, this is the sort of area where you need theories of quantum gravity to talk about in a sensible way to control the effect of the expansion in effective field theory. Okay, so this also relates to a um, long-standing long -standing kind of question of the overshoot, the overshoot problem, which kind of people periodically refer, return to, which is the idea that the vacuum today, as shown on the slide, the barrier to decompactification is likely to be, is likely to be much smaller than the scales of inflation in the early universe. So the, the energy density of the early universe is likely to join the inflation, is likely to be much bigger than the barrier height to decompactification. And so you can kind of view this problem maybe graphically as you're imagining rolling a ball down from the top of Mount Everest, and then you're trying to trap it in a hole with uh, nanometers and with nanometer sides. So why doesn't it just pick up lots of kinetic energy and then overshoot the sides? So I think what the, um, now the, the idea, the kind of nucleus of the idea of how, think, how, you know, how best to, uh, to deal with this problem has been around for a while, but let me just, so let me just kind of review what's this. So if you start with inflation and then you end inflation, and you're starting on this with lots and lots of energy, and then you're going to be rolling down and traveling this long distance in field space to get to the minimum, the potential energy at the top of the slope will be then be converted into kinetic energy. And after inflation, the field will start rolling down the exponential slope. So this is, and it will pick up kinetic energy. And the universe will enter a kinetian epoch, which is an epoch where the energy density of the universe is dominated by kinetic energy. And if you are in a kinetian epoch, then the scale factor goes as t to the one third, and the kinetic energy Go, grows as, uh, what, as 1 over a to, a to the 6. What this, also, this means, and this is the nucleus of the idea of basically how you avoid overshoot, um, this idea has been around for a while, is that any other source of energy, in particular radiation or matter, will redshift slower than the energy density associated to kinetic energy. So while the kinetic energy drops us 1 over a to the 6, the matter or radiation, for example, drop off as 1 over a to the 4. And so if you have any initial seed radiation, that radiation will then come to catch up and act as Hubble friction on the rolling field and break it and slow it and ensure that instead of rolling down here, just going down and over and off, out to decompactification, it will be caught and trapped in the vacuum you want to be in. Right, so during a Kinetian epoch, the universe, the field moves through a Planckian distance in field space every Hubble time. So if you have a long Kinetian epoch in the early universe, then you will have significant trans-Planckian field, field excursions. And this is good if you are interested about questions of quantum gravity applied to the early universe, because when you have trans-Planckian field excursions, then you need a theory of the Planck scale in order to, de to deal with them properly. But it's a relatively, there's been a relatively unexplored area. There's quite a lot of work on 
Transplanking field exertion is drawing inflation, and the relation to observing tensor perturbations in the CMB, but less on such field excursions during carnation epochs. So if you have, so the, so if you have seed radiation and you have this long carnation epoch, then the seed radiation can grow and it can catch up in any density and then it will bring the universe onto, what's called a tra onto a tracker solution where the universe evolves with a fixed fractions of radiation, potential energy, and kinetic energy. And if you want the radiation, if you start with small amounts of radiation and you want to catch up, then you need to evolve through many Planckian distances to reach the tra this tracker solution and evolve, o evolve overshoot. And this... The 57 over 81 and the 16. Um, it's, it's basically just the... So the fact that it's the 1 over 8 of the 4 um, works its way through. I mean, it's some, you know, if you do P is rho to the gamma, then things appear as, you know, root gamma, gamma minus 1 and so on. It, there's no obvious way you end up at these, the, uh, at these precise ratios, and it's different for radiation and matter. Yeah, but... That there is a tracker solution is kind of important. That it's pre these precise ra ratios is not important. OK, so what are the possible sources of seed radiation you can have? If you imagine coming off inflation, and then you're going to be rolling down a, a, far, a, a very, very steep slope. So, so one possibility is the thermal de Sitter bath. So this will always give you some some kind of a quantity of, initial quantity of radiation. Another thing is conversion, if you've got a volume mod, if you've got the volume modulus that's rolling down to large volumes, is kind of, essentially kind of, quote unquote, perturbative uh, decays, quote unquote, of the volume field to radiation to which it couples as it starts, to, starts rolling down the slope. And both suggest to you that you should expect to have an initial fraction in radiation that scales as the Hubble scale, the, as H squared, over, over M Planck. Um, the dimensions of that aren't right. Um, probably need another, an M Planck squared there. Okay, so, yeah, which, which, will be, which will be small. Another interesting possible source, so these are the, just the possible sources, is if you, have a, if you have something like cosmic strings at the end of inflation. So, for example, um, these can be formed, formed by brain inflation. Then, if you have cosmic strings, they form a string network. They can radiate gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves, obviously, will redshift as radiation. Um, this, this gives quite a fun possible scenario, because, the, because when you're in a carnation epoch, all the radiation kind of grows relative to the carnation. So if you have some cosmic string network formed at the end of inflation emitting gravitational waves, and then the gravitational waves kind of come to dominate, you know, will grow relative to the carnation, you can kind of hit an epoch where the energy density of the universe is dominantly in the form of gravitational waves, which I'm not sure you can kind of... I don't know whether you could do anything with it, because this, these all kind of dissipate away later on, but it's even the idea that the universe could, go, could pass through an epoch where its energy density was dominantly in the form of gravitational waves, I think is kind of quite fun, and possibly one can get you know, some fun observational consequences of it. Okay, so the so this long kind of Canadian epoch says if you're going to if you're going to have to travel many Planckian distances after after inflation, I think it gives you some quite interesting phenomenology. Um, another thing, like I said, is in terms of fundamental strings. You know, um, the in terms of phenological or cosmological consequences of string theory. You know, the most kind of exciting case would be potentially if you had a network of fundamental strings. Um, stretching across the universe. Um, this is not excluded. I mean, if the string scale is significantly lower than the Planck scale, as it is, for example, in LVS, or where the volume, if, if, you make, if the volume is much larger, um, this could actually, you know, this, there's nothing which kind of, nothing, nothing excludes the possibility of having a cosmic superstring network. Um, and this is something, you know, again, if you had brain inflation and then you had this you know, giving strings and then a long epoch um, of evolution afterwards, this is another possibility you could get. So I think if you have a vacuum in asymptotic regimes and then the 
the, the long carnation epoch you need to get there can give quite a lot of interesting um, phonology. Okay, and look, finally, um, I hate the anthropic principle, but there is also a possible and interesting anthropic thing about this, which is that the, is there involving the hierarchy between the inflation scale and the weak scale. So if you come back to this picture of overshoot, this, the properties of this vacuum normally tie to the electoral weak scale in some sense. The properties of how much energy density you have up there tie to the inflation scale. The ability for seed radiation to grow as you roll down, to grow large enough to stop you getting overshoot, requires you to have a long period of roll, which requires the scale of this to be much, much higher than the scale of this. So somewhat paradoxically, the higher up you start on this slope, the easier it is to avoid overshoot, which is kind of counter to your intuition from classical mechanics, where you would think that you know, the higher up you start, the more kinetic energy you have, and the more problematic it has. But cosmologically, it's actually it's the other way around. And this gives you a sort of semi-anthropic argument to say to, for a large hierarchy between the inflation scale and, and the weak scale, if you like the anthropic principle, which I do not. So the higher up, the higher up, the, lo so the higher up comes in two ways. So the higher up, the, the seed radiation you get, the, the, initial, the, the, quantity, the fraction of initial radiation normally scales as, the, as, as, as h squared over m Planck squared. So the higher up you are, the higher the initial Hubble scale. So the higher up you are, you start with a higher fraction originally in radiation. And also the higher up you are, the longer you have to travel before you, before you reach the place where the vacuum is. So that means that you've got longer for the seed radiation to grow and bring you onto the tracker. Yeah. So those are the two things you, you gain from, from being higher up. Yeah. Okay, so conclusions. Um, so if, if string pheno means under, trying to understand this universe as a vacuum state of string theory, then it suggests that in terms of the kind of the M theory Octopus, the boundaries of that are natural places for phenologically viable vacua to live. The first part of the talk was looking at the properties of such vacua, viewed them as an ADS vacua from a CFT perspective. Um, it suggests such vacua would be highly restrictive. So this um, is interesting because it gives you the possibility of either sort of ruling in or ruling out su such vacua, because if you showed, for example, that such vacuum could not possibly exist, you know, could be ruled out from a CFT side, then that would be um, important. And likewise, if there were some special value, special points about those conformal dimensions I, I mentioned, then that would essentially kind of rule, or almost effectively rule such vacuum in. And it also motivates a distinct cosmology, um, i.e. that of a long kination epoch, which interesting phenological opportunities. Thank you all for listening, and that's the end of the talk. So, okay, so, so, so maybe sm smoking gun is always a little, a little strong, but, but, but examples of things like you, ca you, you can do, for example, that you could have a... Um, yeah, you, so, for example, you could have... So one of the things that the string scale changes from, from the start from inflation to where you are now. So this, for example, I mentioned like string networks, for example. So normally you would say... Oh, well, you, if the strings, you, you, can't, you can't form super string, string networks because the string tension is kind of probably likely to be too high. But you could, then you could have something where the string tension is actually gut scale or something during inflation, and then it rolls down. Um, in the long canation epoch, the string scale comes down. So you can have cosmic strings that are formed at the gut scales, cosmic super strings formed at the gut scale, which could then come down to the present universe. And then if you have, you know, and so then, yeah, the prospect of, so if you have a, cosmic superstring network with, you know, G mu as 10 to the minus 9, nothing rules that out, and, yeah, that's the sort of the range where some future experiments will look, um, you know, I'm not going to say it's kind of a, a definite prediction or anything, but, you know, anything that motivates you to look for the possibility of 
fundamental superstrings in the sky, um, yeah, given the energy scales involved, there's something worth looking for. What, what would yeah. be the observable point if, the, if there is a, a network of fundamental strings in the sky? What, what so the, so the, 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 class, the classic one is microlensing. I mean, that's the classic way you look for cosmic, cosmic strings. You have a galaxy behind a cosmic right, string, and you, see. and you see two, yeah, and you see two images, and you pick up. That's the classic observable. Um, whether, and I think you might need new observables to get to the lower tensions, but I so I don't know the exact, all the observational things, but that is the classic observational signature of, of, of cosmic string networks. Yeah. No, so the DJKT, so the DJKT ones, which are the flux ones from 2A, they have, let me just come back to, so they have a, the SUSY vacuole is the one I mainly focused on. Um, they also have non susy ones, which are basically like skew flux signs. So the conformal dimensions for the, are shown here for the non susy ones, but then there is a SUSY one for DJKT. For LVS, LVS is not super symmetric right from, right from the get-go. Okay, so one thing, it's a conjecture. The other thing I, I don't really like about... So, there, okay, there is this argument which goes that if you have non-supersymmetric vacua, you should never think about holography. And the argument is that if you've got any decay channel, however suppressed it is, then from the ADS side, it's always instantaneous because the volume of ADS is infinite, so you end up basically multiplying um, infinity by e to the minus 100, and you always get... Something I've never thought that was a so this is the, basically this argument. Um, uh, that, that's, that's the, the yeah, so 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 I've never liked this argument, and the reason I've never liked this argument is basically it's tied to having the volume of ADS infinite, and as, you know, so the slightest correction making that finite, then your e to the minus 100, 100. So it's not an argument I. Um, yeah, so this is the, it relies on the infinite volume of exact ADS, and anything which basically takes you away from exact. ADS. Even if it's actually, yeah, I'm not defending this. But this is the argument people give, but it's not an argument I... Um, yeah, it's not an argument I... I can't. Yeah, I mean, it, so, it's, so this is, remember, this, this, is, this is in an effective field theory perspective. So this sort of question of non, of non perturbative instabilities from a full string side, I'm not sure you can easily do, you can easily do that analysis. But from a, but this comes back to, the, if you ha, even if you have, yeah, from a phenological point of view, if you have, you know, obviously the proton is unstable in the standard model and we don't, and we don't care about it. Um, from a phonological point of view, if an instability is sufficiently non-perturbative, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter phonologically. So I think if you, okay, so there's two sides, obviously there's two sides, there's first of all, there's the ADF-CFT link that says you have a, this kind of thing down to the ADS um, and say that then you can just draw a kind of equivalency sign to a CFT. So if you could draw that equivalency line and you could rule out the CFT, then you would also rule out the, the vacuum. So, yeah, so there is the, you know, that, yeah, which would be kind of quite good if you could rule out, you know, could you do an end run around 
this kind of thing where you start with 10D and you compactify to 40, and you have a way to say, you know, the LVS or something is just not, is not consistent. I mean, that would be definitely an important result. Yes. Any more? Okay.